because the effect of dehydration or desalination on blood pressure can lag behind, classically known as the lag effect, and therefore you need to wait for days or sometimes a few weeks to be able to see the effect of ultrafiltration on changing cardiovascular parameters. And, and, and in this context, it's also important to understand where the fluid in the salt resides. So we all know of the interstitial compartment that buffers the, the blood between the cellular space and the plasma compartment. And, 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 and occupies a volume of between 10 to 15 liters, of course, determined by the patient's body weight. But, but in this regard, it's, it's um, um, useful to um, recognize that the distribution of this compartment varies such that um, uh, women tend to can have more extracellular water than men. As you can see, I mentioned the total body water decreases with age and obesity. So when somebody gains weight due to fat accumulation, that may not be accompanied by proportional increase in the total body water or the extracellular water compartment. Um, of course, extracellular water fraction is higher in non-ambulant patients uh, and of course in women. So there are variations according to gender specifics and demographics in terms of how this proportion of fluid compartments are distributed in individuals. And, and it's important to appreciate that when you're trying to assess weight and volume status. Classically, the interstitial compartment is assessed by presence of edema, um, which is then correlated with changes in the blood pressure, uh, presence of crackles in the chest, or in, and, and, and with the interdiatic weight gains. Um, so um, we have done some service to look at how, how clinicians and frontline staff tend to assess dry weight in hemodialysis. So a, this is a UK study I'm presenting to you uh, where we ask clinicians and nurses what they use. And as you can see, top of the list is peripheral edema or presence or absence of it, the blood pressure, intradialytic changes, interdialytic weight gain, uh, auscultation of the chest, jugular venous pressure, typical clinical signs that we tend to use. And of course, in about um, 20 to 40 percent, patients uh, are being assessed by the use of additional devices, such as um, red blood volume monitor or blind impedance devices. Of these, um, there are some studies to show that between these clinical signs, jugular venous pressure perhaps has the highest specificity. Uh, why is presence of edema is, is most often utilized because it's an easy sign to look for it isn't the most specific in terms of reflecting the expansion of the external uh, uh, water space. But um, an important conclusion from this sort of a uh, profile pattern recognition is that there is no single measure of volume status that can give you the, 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 the perfect indication of what the optimal euvolemic state of that patient should be. But usually a, a conglomerate of these has to be used in, in clinical practice. So, um, sorry, I think I moved one slide ago. Interdialytic fluid again is another very commonly used variable. And this study published not so long ago, the bottom half shows that actually what does matter is the amount of interdialytic weight gain that the patient is exposed to in that between dialysis phase. And you can see on the top left hand panel, the change in interdialytic fluid gain or the expansion of the spaces is not uniform or linear by any means. There is much uh, much uh, significant, much significant ex expansion of the blood volume towards the end of the interdiatic phase, i.e. 12 hours leading on to dialysis. And therefore it's not a linear relationship of the cumulative, ex and the cumulative exposure might be much more important than a particular expansion of, uh, on a particular day. Back to edema. So edema remains um, one of the commonly used signs, but this study by Rajiv Agarwal shows that it isn't a very good determinant of the intravascular volume space compared with intravenous uh, inferior venic diameters or blood volume measures. Um, it correlates very well with cardiovascular risk factors though, i.e. age, body mass index, and left ventricular mass, uh, mass indices. So why is this a good predictor of cardiovascular reserve? It may not be a very good indication of the volume compartments and status, uh, particularly the intravascular space. And, and this is largely because um, in human physiology, we have edema preventing mechanisms. So why is the patients are perhaps gaining volume, which is expanding the external compartment? The interstitial expansion is limited by the rise in colloid osmotic pressures to offset the hydrostatic pressure rise within the intravascular space. 
So edema has to be assessed taking these factors in mind and that it should not be used as a sine qua non of fluid uh, excess. This is where use of other uh, devices come in handy and one most uh, commonly uh, being used and studied in clinical research is, is the use of a bioimpedance device which provides a numeric value of these fluid compartments i.e. it can tell you that of the body weight of say 60 kilograms of 40 liters is in the extra, you know, is total body water, and of that, maybe 25 liters are, are, um, is in the is in the uh, extra water compartment. And as you can see, it's uh, relatively easy to uh, undertake these measurements. Uh, you typically apply some electrodes across the dorsum of the wrist and of the foot, and and is then connected to a device that then um, uses a low amplitude electric current through the cables. Uh, connected to the electrodes in contact with the skin, permitting the measurement of reactance and resistance. Low impedance means excess water and that the measured change in impedance is calculated from the reactance and the resistance using mathematical equations. So the body compartments can then be split into fat mass, the fat free mass or the, or the lean mass and the total body water. The latest development in bioimpedance is the incorporation of body composition model. Because as I mentioned before, um, measurement of a water uh, composition in a, in a tissue is a, is a composite of the change in the water content, but also change in its fat content perhaps, or cell content. And it's this incorporation of the body composition model that has been incorporated into recent bioimpedance devices, which then predicts a normally hydrated weight taking into account the patient's own body composition, i.e. the fat mass and the lean body mass. So this is a sophistication or advancement in the bioimpedance device that makes it more relevant to clinical practice and allows us to, us to determine the patient's normally hydrated weight. This has been studied in the dialysis population. Uh, um, uh, one of these devices, there are several devices out in the, uh, in the available, but not many of them have validated algorithms. Some of them do. Um, and, 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 and have been examined in dialysis patients. Um, and you can see that this is a clinical st study showing how you can use bioimpedance device to optimize volume station status in hemodialysis. As you can see, the fluid overload index, um, which is measure of the composition of volume normalized to the external weight over months, reducing as the patient uh, is approaching his, his target weight both for the initial and the pre and the post weight measure. These measurements were taken at the start of the study, at the middle and towards the end. And it's the time average fluid overload as an index that gives you a measure of, it's a mean of the pre dialysis and the post dialysis fluid status. So this is, 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 a, is a tool that is in use uh, to look at whether one can more directly measure the external water compartment uh, rather than body weight alone. So this clinical study looked at two groups of patients. Uh, group A of patients where patients were overloaded and the group B were the ones who had rather unstable dialysis, i.e. frequent hypertensive sessions. And you can see over that period of monitoring, I think this is over a nine month period, um, three measurements were made uh, and there was improvement in both the pre-dialysis hydration state um, during the period of the study, both in group A and group B. And similarly, an improvement in the post-hydration status in group A and group B. The study group reported 35% um, reduction in antihypertensives and, uh, and uh, an improvement in fluid status in the group B patients who are unstable and increasing the weight by 1.3 liters. Importantly, there was 73% reduction in intradialytic adverse events, uh, which is, is highly significant. Um, does this help improve cardiovascular parameters in hemodialysis patients? Not a lot of studies, but this is perhaps only one to look at at this stage where 156 patients were studied over two centers and there are two groups. One were being monitored using bioimpedance devices twice monthly in the intervention group and the other every three months in the control group. And you can see that the endpoint was an LV mass change at one year and there was a significant regression of LV mass index from 131 to 116 grams per meter squared in the intervention group, uh, which was quite significant. 
uh, and improvement of other cardiovascular indices. Um, interestingly, there was only a modest reduction in the fluid status. Um, so, so some indication that that actually optimizing volume status using a more refined tools such as bioimpedance can lead to improved cardiovascular parameters. However, please note the last point mentioned in the slide: the proportion of anuric patients in the intervention group increased to 90 percent at 12 months, which was also significant. And and this is where uh, the management of fluid balance in these patients becomes a fine line between overhydration and 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 and, and dehydration, uh, perhaps leading to loss of residual renal function. So bioimpedance has its limitations. It assumes the body of the cylindrical model uh, uh, on which the algorithm is based. Of course, it doesn't measure fluid content of the trunkal tissue, and therefore pulmonary edema or fluid in the pulmonary tissue can be uh, can be missed. Uh, uh, it's unreliable when there's rapid changes in tissue composition. Pregnancy is a classic example. You cannot use it in patients who have pacemaker devices, and 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 there is there is lack of data on overall clinical outcomes in large studies. And this is where I think we are likely to be um, seeing some increasing evidence of how this might uh, pan out in clinical practice. This is a BISTRO trial currently underway in the UK comparing intervention of bioimpedance um, by in comparison to a control group to look at whether it has a beneficial or detrimental effect in maintaining uh, or preserving residual kidney function in incident hemodialysis patients. So, so there is, um, 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 there is, there is gathering momentum in terms of trying to improve the evidence base on using more refined tools as an adjunct to the established clinical uh, science of assessing fluid balance and, and trial rate. One key aspect of, of fluid overload is, of course, the content of water in the in the primary tissue, and and the classical conundrum of whether this is heart failure or excess fluid overload in clinical practice. Uh, remains um, you know, very difficult and challenging uh, today. Uh, typically, we tend to do x-rays to look for uh, these curly B lines, but as we know, routine, routinely we don't do x-rays in dialysis patients, and therefore it's not easy to use this uh, technique to assess, uh, assess uh, primary uh, uh, fluid overload. Uh, but clearly there is evidence that, that these um, lung congestion is strongly linked to uh, mortality in dialysis patients and, and many of the signs that are in use and even the devices that I've talked about cannot uh, reliably pick up the amount of water content of dialysis uh, patients in the, in the lung tissue. In this regard, I'd like to point to an advance that is uh, perhaps underway in terms of how to improve our assessment of primary, primary uh, uh, interstitial water content content. This is the use of um, ultrasound bedside where um, these, um, these um, um, vertical lines that you see on the right-hand panel uh, on the ultrasound probe across the chest wall, also known as lung comets, um, are shown to be very sensitive in indicating interstitial edema in the lung tissue compared to a normal appearance of a lung tissue as shown on the left-hand panel. These lung comets um, uh, have been looked at in dialysis patients and have been shown to um, uh, be significantly reduced during the during the treatment of hemodialysis. There's almost a dose dependent, a dose response relationship in dialysis patients between the number of ultrasound B lines or the lung comets, um, and 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 they relate quite well to um, cardiovascular indices of of uh, um, LVMI and injection fraction. So so emerging evidence that we may be able to use some bedside tool to aid assessment of fluid content of of lung tissue, uh, and I think there are larger trials being uh, designed and underway to level lung comet scores in, in predicting uh, um, overhydration in, in, in the pulmonary bed. So once the assessment has been made, the next uh, key step is to decide how we get the patients to reach their target weight. And uh, again, uh, uh, last year we surveyed um, dialysis centers in asking how do they tend to um, uh, approach um, setting their target weight and approaching target weight in their patients. And you can see there are three key responses. Uh, the first one was uh, majority said that uh, more than half of uh, patients, uh, that the survey clinicians and nurses said they use systematically use the 
drive it until this is as low as tolerated with the aim of reducing the antihypertensive drugs. The other uh, approaches were to reach a compromise between reducing the dry weight and maintaining urine volume, even if this may mean a greater need for antihypertensives. And, and, and some others who said they, they do have a definitive policy to stratify the approach to take into account the patient's cardiovascular and autonomic function into account. So these seem to be the three predominant approaches. The most widely used, of course, are uh, option number one. And, and in here, uh, uh, it's, it's been classically described in the literature as a probing for dry weight. Um, and there have been some trials to look at how effectively this sort of approach can actually lead to improvement in, in blood pressure control. So this is the DRIP trial. Um, published in 2009 by Rajiv Agarwal, where he used um, such a, uh, an approach um, to reduce dry weight over an eight-week period. And he clearly showed that by assuming a weight loss of 0. 0.1 kilogram, one kilogram per 10 kilograms of pay, uh, per, per dialysis, he was able to reduce blood pressure significantly, both for systolic and diastolic, in the intervention group. And that's how we approached it. Art filtration was not tolerated. Uh, um, they were uh, progressively reducing their weight loss until the patient was said to be at the dry weight. Um, the interesting thing was there was hardly any change in uh, KDQL uh, in the patients. Perhaps the study was of much shorter duration to reflect changes in patient symptom parameters and quality of life. However, there were some significant events in adverse effects. Uh, as you can see, there was a higher prevalence of clotted access in patients who had the more aggressive arch filtration approach as opposed to the control group. Um, uh, and, and, and this um, uh, is a significant uh, problem in terms of trying to cause hemodynamic disturbances um, in, in reducing dry weight uh, aggressively. This has been noted recently where large databases have been looked at and high ultrafiltration rates have been associated with significant hemodynamic and cardiovascular effects, both in terms of morbidity and mortality. Um, uh, such that um, uh, there has been a proposed limit to a maximum ultrafiltration rate of, of between 10 to 15 mils per minute uh, per kilo per minute. And it's based on the uh, uh, data sets that has also been replicated in the European studies where, as you can see, our alpha filtration of more than 12.3 mils per hour per kilo body weight has been associated with an increased risk of mortality in a five-year perspective observation group. So that suggests that there, there has to be some physiological limits within which uh, fluid changes should occur during hemodialysis and it should be and it should be normalized to the patient's body weight and, and, the, and the rate at which the fluid is removed. So the same amount of fluid being removed in a 50 kilogram person versus a 100 kilogram person would have different hemodynamic consequences and perhaps long-term effects. This equates to about a, a, a change in 8 to 12 percent of relative blood volume per hour, which is again another index of how safely one can remove fluid without causing adverse hemodynamics hemodynamic effects. So it's important to understand how to prescribe ultrafiltration um, and, and how that might be done in the most safe and effective manner. This is essentially uh, a pressure driven process whereby across the membrane using a, a pressure gradient fluid in terms of salt and water an isotonic field rate of plasma is removed across the membrane. Um, uh, and the transmembrane pressure gradient gives an indication of the amount of, um, of, of ch change in pressure between the two compartments. Uh, this is preset by the operator uh, and, and the direct control of fluid flux uh, almost removes the potential, potential of physiologic self-regulation that exists in otherwise um, uh, um, fluid shifts during normal physiology. And these are highly accurate volumetric machines um, which, which uh, have been calibrated such that for every one liter of ultrafiltrate removed, there is an error of between 10 to 14 mils or less. Um, however, 
it's also important to understand the fluid compartment that is that is predominantly affected by the process of ultrafiltration is the microcirculation, which is a which is a capillary bed uh, across which fluid shifts uh, during the process of ultrafiltration. Um, and and across the fluid capillaries there will be fluid exchange, and and as you can see that different uh, capillaries have differently designed pore capillaries. Um, other than other than the brain where they, there exist tight junctions, the rest of the water movement is predominantly acroporin mediated, and the alveoli particularly can be very permeable to rapid water transport, leading to pulmonary edema, um, which is a slightly more special variety of fluid overloading uremia, not easily picked up by by impedance. Um, so so you know so this microcirculation has to be in an optimum state, and and whenever there is a failure of ultrafiltration, it's usually due to high degree of microcirculatory uh, resistance or vaso intense vasoconstriction that shuts off the blood compartment from from uh, further ultrafiltration. During fluid exchanges, of course, apart from the fluid shift uh, being induced by the volumetric device, there are of course other um, fluid shifts taking place in terms of the fluid being uh, taken in by the patient, insensible loss, washbacks, flushes, and of course any drugs being administered. So these all have to add up or be added up uh, at the time of setting the ultrafiltration volume to be removed during dialysis. So back to the microcirculated stress. This is this is really the key, key adaptive mechanism that uh, ensures that a safe ultrafiltration can take place. If you imagine uh, a plasma volume is uh, to the order of two to three liters in, a, in, a, in an average uh, individual, uh, although we sometimes end up taking three to four liters of fluid off. So it's important that these compensatory mechanisms can stabilize the blood compartment to be able to remove that fluid from the external water space. And in this, there are three mechanisms that are at play. Cardiopulmonary reflex is, is one that happens within seconds. Um, and and, and it's, it's essentially um, a, a mechanism that restores arterial pressure level within 20 to 40 seconds from the perturbation. The most important mechanism subsequently taking place is plasma refilling, which is a net effect of um, the ultrafiltration rate uh, and the rate at which uh, fluid is refilling from the interstitial to the plasma compartment. And of course, if this refilling rate is exceeded uh, in terms of the ultrafiltration rate, then there will be subsequent baroreflexes or arterial uh, intense vasoconstriction that sets in uh, to protect the blood compartment. Now, if we knew the refilling rate, it would be easy to prescribe ultrafiltration to match that refilling rate from the interstitial to the blood compartment. However, as you can see, there are loads of factors that could uh, affect plasma refilling, uh, even changes in posture, um, uh, eating, body position, and other factors can lead to changes in plasma refill. And here are some studies where we were looking at changing in refilling rate, and you can see it's, 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 it's pretty much unpredictable. There's no pattern recognition there, and, and it, there's a huge amount of um, dynamic change during dialysis to refilling rates itself. This makes the process of prescribing ultrafiltration rather tricky and, and, and complex. The best way to gauge or have an idea of how well the patient is plasma refilling is the use of a blood volume monitor, whereby uh, the change uh, in blood density induced by the change in plasma volume uh, and ultrafiltration is, is, uh, is depicted as a curve on, 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 on a blood volume monitor. This is essentially a change in optical density of the blood due, induced by ultrafiltration, and it assumes that the red cell compartment or the solid cell compartment is constant uh, during this process. So a shift of 100% to 80% means 20% rise in optical of blood density or 20% fall in blood volume. So these are two types of sensors, um, um, optical or sonic. Uh, that are typically built into dialysis machines these days to allow us to be able to monitor in real time the change in blood volume or blood density induced by ultrafiltration. Here is a patient undergoing ultrafiltration. As you can see, the blue line shows a reduction in rate of blood volume during this process of standard fixed rate ultrafiltration. Um, and, and towards the end, as the patient approaches dry weight, there's a sharp dip in the, uh, in the, in the blood volume trace which means a very sharp increase in blood density, indicating that there's loss of plasma refill and that that patient is, is, uh, is, is probably at, a, at their target weight. So, uh, and patients can become symptomatic at this stage with cramps and other symptoms. 
So, so a flat line of red blood drop would indicate adequate refilling being taken place, whereas a very steep, sharp linear drop can mean that refilling is inadequate and further filtration can lead to compromises in the cardiovascular or the hemodynamic status of the patient, i.e. falling blood pressure. And the reason why these, uh, these uh, indices are important is because you can see if you looked at hydraulic permeability of the tissues, you could have uh, various types of patients on dialysis, patients who have a high refilling rate but may not necessarily with an expanded extracellular compartment. Similarly, patients with low refilling rate with expanded extracellular compartment. Quadrant D is typically uh, diabetic patients where fluid may be very difficult to remove even if there is evidence of extracellular overload. And so, so, so your patient profiles may fit into one of these quadrants and an understanding of that patient phenotype can help you um, uh, um, address some of the strategies to remove fluid in order to achieve uh, the target weight. It is, it is, it is this sort of um, um, pathophysiology that is taken into account when KDOKI recommends different strategies to remove fluid in an optimal and safe manner. Um, so these are the typical recommendations that uh, you either slow down the ultrafiltration rate, uh, use blood volume monitor, sodium profiling, isolated ultrafiltration, or cooling the dialysis temperature down. And as you can say, these mechanisms act by three predominant um, uh, mechanisms, either by preserving blood volume, uh, improving the constrictive power of the blood circulation, the microcirculation, um, or improving the cardiac response. Some of these are, are utilized in clinical practice, but not all. Um, cooling the dial as a temperature down is a particularly effective maneuver. As you can see here, there is improvement in, in, in thermal balance um, induced by, by a cooling the dial as it down or controlling the net thermal balance during dialysis. Uh, and this leads to often uh, stabilization of the mean arterial blood pressure. Most studies report a benefit with a temperature dialysis between 35 to 36 uh, uh, degrees Celsius. And, and this, this maneuver is particularly effective when the patients have a low pre-dialytic temperature or have got cardiac compromise. And there are various devices in use, i.e. the blood temperature module, built-in devices within dialysis machines that can be utilized to control the, the, the effective thermal flux during dialysis or cool the patient down. Uh, and this, this maneuver can be particularly effective in, in hot uh, 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 weather and, and in higher temperatures uh, environment in dialysis units. Uh, loss of sodium is is um, is also uh, an effective strategy. However, you can see that during ultrafiltration, which is as I said, an isotonic uh, filter of plasma, you tend to remove salt and water both. So, uh, and a, a typical dialysis would remove. Um, approximately 233 millimoles or for a 1.8 liter ultrafiltrate. That may not be sufficient and you may want to remove more salt from the patient. That's why you can change the dialysis sodium setting to, to induce further diffusive transfer of sodium. This, this strategy is not widely recommended because it's very difficult to prescribe accurate diffusive sodium transport due to a lot of errors in machine proportioning uh, not all of the sodium is, is plasma-free sodium, etc. So there are a lot of technical uh, inadequacies in trying to be um, accurate in their prescription of how much sodium to remove through diffusive uh, losses. And and the studies have not been have been small and inconclusive. Whilst you can stabilize uh, a, a dialysis procedure by increasing sodium in the dialysis site, you would risk sodium accumulation over time. Much more effective strategy is to is to change the ultrafiltration schedules. So uh, um, there have been different uh, set patterns of ultrafiltration that have been considered um, uh, deviating from the standard fixed rate pro profiling to uh, a more steadily declining, declining rate or even an intermittent ultrafiltration profile. Unfortunately, the left-hand panel numbers show that the increased incidence of hypotension is much, much higher when you uh, have a set pattern of ultrafiltration with intermittent pauses. Uh, and this is largely because whilst it is trying to match patients' refill, as I mentioned to you before, the refilling rate is constantly changing. It does not follow a set pattern. Um, so so the, the most safest and the most uh, 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 convenient profile is to have a steadily declining rate, uh, which is uh, the number two profile on that left-hand panel. Uh, uh, 
um, a much more refined device is biofeedback, whereby uh, you can actually change the machine can actually change the ultra filtration rate constantly, in order for the blood volume trajectory with actual patient's blood volume to follow um, a predicted blood volume profile that is preset by the operator. So as you can see in the bottom panel on the x-axis, the ultra filtration rate here is being constantly varied to for the patient's blood volume profile to follow that trajectory. Um, and this essentially is the closest you can get to matching the patient's changing uh, 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 refilling uh, status. Um, changing the session length or the frequency is an effective maneuver and is often pre uh, utilized in home hemodialysis uh, where, um, where um, volume management is superior to standard fixed uh, scheduled dialysis in center um, for a variety of reasons but as you can see you can have much more freedom and flexibility with tailoring the ultra filtration rate to the patient's tolerated ultra filtration uh, uh, refilling uh, characteristics. Um, and blood pressure can change in different ways and do not necessarily parallel the change in refill. So as you can see, blood pressure can move up during the analysis or uh, fall steadily, which is typically with fluid removal, or have sharp dips, whereby there are periods of instability that need to be addressed. And these dips in blood pressure during the analysis can be significant, as you can see. Uh, uh, blood pressure variability of more than 8.7 millimeter mercury here is associated with a higher hazard of death compared to low blood pressure variability. So it's important to try and provide a smoother profile, a smoother profile of blood pressure during dialysis as possible in order to prevent or reduce intradialytic events. And in this regard, there have been several strategies suggested. One effective maneuver when you're encountering patients with very unstable dialysis is the use of metadrine. Um, or, or, uh, whereby, um, given pre-dialysis, uh, it can stabilize by increasing the vasomotor tone of the patients, usually well tolerated, although there are some recognized side effects. Um, a word about diuretics in that fluzomide is being increasingly used in, di in, in dialysis, and you can see that top right-hand panel showing a UK survey showing that 93% of the patients are on diuretics if they have a degree of renal uh, output. And that's been a, quite a significant change in clinical practice in the past um, uh, 10 years, perhaps, with the recognition that the residual urine volume can contribute significantly to improving fluid balance in our patients. Um, uh, with regards to other antihypertensive medications, uh, it's well known that most of the ACE inhibitors are removed during dialysis and therefore can call, uh, lead to um, and affect blood pressure and volume uh, assessment uh, uh, during dialysis. Um, a much better uh, or favorable pharmacokinetic profile with uh, angiotensin blockers, which uh, are largely retained and not removed during standard dialysis. With beta blockers, again, um, uh, carvedilol has the most favorable profile, uh, not being removed on dialysis. So essentially, some of the drugs that are removed on dialysis should be used or taken well outside the dialysis cycle. Otherwise, they're likely to influence the, the cardiovascular parameters. Uh, which are often used to assess polling parameters. Um, and, and in terms of hypertension, Andrew Davenport's publication here in 2008 shows that if you were to reduce antihypertensives, the ones to start off with are alpha blockers, uh, and, then, and then gradually uh, uh, the other agents, depending on the patient's need uh, and blood pressure control. Um, so, so whilst I've given you an idea of how to reduce uh, target weight, use of diuretics, change in frequency and session length of dialysis, and perhaps consider, in addition to salt restriction, tailoring the dialysis sodium uh, to match it to be close to patient sodium, um, one other important factor to bear in mind when uh, optimally removing fluid is to actually assess the patient's cardiovascular phenotype. Um, and, and as you can see, there are different, using echo measurements, one can profile patients into different cardiac phenotypes and, and, uh, and where, the, where the patient have, has a very high peripheral resistance, for example, profile three, one might you want to use vasodilators, uh, whereas the other varieties, volume removal might be more effective. So, so cardiovascular uh, uh, status uh, and indices are important to consider while deciding on an ultrafiltration strategy in these patients. Um, as I mentioned to you, there is no single sort of measure to actually uh, uh, work on when you're trying to approach dry weight in patients, but it's important to have a protocol. And um, 
uh, certainly in, in, in uh, Europe, UK, and even in the US, US, there appears to be lack of well-defined protocols. My recommendation to you would be to actually use some of the pathophysiological understanding uh, and your patient phenotypes to design a protocol of approaching dry weight in your own units. And here is an example of one. Um, but what you need to do is uh, define how you would assess your target weight and, and, and dry weight using the information that you have uh, along with cardiovascular reserve and IU tolerance. Um, define the practice parameters of rate limitation, frequency, time, and interventions, but also measure the efficacy of the protocol through uh, what you're achieving in terms of normal volumia, blood pressure control, fluid usage, and, and, um, and, and complications associated with fluid imbalance. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sandeep, for 